Welcome to this special edition of the Holstein House podcast. This is Robin Holstein, your host and the owner and proprietor of Holstein House Bed and Breakfast. I was really excited to be offered a part in the workshop special programming today. I've learned a lot about tools, certain brands, and content creation through Tim's YouTube channel. My inaugural episode was posted on October the 15th of this year. I'm still growing my podcast and my YouTube page, and I hope you'll subscribe to both. Now, if you find yourself traveling to or through West Virginia along Interstate 6477, also known as the West Virginia Turnpike, consider staying at Holstein House. You can find out more at my website, robinholstein.com. Now, this special edition includes clips of my interviews with Lisa Hayes Miney, an award-winning West Virginia writer and author and Toolman Tim himself and wife Becky. And then I close with the story of my friend Diane and her struggles with liver disease and how you can help. So buckle in my friend and let's get started. Welcome ladies and gentlemen, friends and foes alike. I am the West Virginia woman, Robin Holstein of RobinHolstein.com and Holstein House, where my guests get a good night's sleep at a fair rate, plus breakfast. I've been keeping house since I was 17 years old, balancing the budget and paying the bills as an army wife on the salary of a PFC stationed at Fort Hood, Texas, and as a single mother of two back home in West Virginia. Things have changed a lot since then, but I haven't forgotten what it was like. This podcast looks at society and cultural issues affecting families in West Virginia and in the United States, from food preparation and storage, gardening, home repairs, current events, and more. We'll go round the table and back in 60 minutes or less. So let's hang out and talk a while. I've known Lisa Hayes Miney for over 20 years. I'm not sure how I found her page, West Virginia Cottages, but I reached out to her for advertising. I was building a website for my husband's band, Rock and Horse, and wanted to promote them with an advertisement. Lisa knew full well that the Southern Rock Band from West Virginia wasn't a cottage industry, but she allowed limited promotion. Then over the years, things changed, and we changed with them, but Lisa and I have remained in contact since at least 1999. She is probably the most diverse and accomplished woman I know. She imagined, created, and published, then distributed the most popular free magazine focusing on local culture and activities in West Virginia for over 10 years. She and her husband printed 18,000 copies and distributed them within 18 West Virginia counties. They had over 100 subscriptions mailed out every month, covering 16 different states. And they experienced less than a 1% unread rate or copies that were not distributed all while staying true to her calling as a writer and author. She has reimagined and recreated herself successfully multiple times, and she's received several awards in the process. This is the second and final part of my interview with Lisa. My my first community event. Apparently, this is yeah. a week for you know a month for first for or something. First, yeah. Um, I I felt I felt I did pretty well. I did sell. I have I have multiple books. Um, my two main books that I um that I promote is um Life in the Slow Lane, and mm-hmm. that is where I went through ten years of my writing in Two Lane Living Magazine, and I I picked my favorites. Uh, and I'm not the only columnist that did that. Um, Sherry Brake has done that. Max Samples has done that. I've got some people um, that are working on theirs now. Uh, Russ Richardson started with his columns and and has, a, you know, he's working now on a th- trilogy of his life in the forest. 
So that's a revisit of um, my favorite two lane living columns. And, you know, uh, I, that one did very well at, at the sale. There were a lot of people that wanted to do that for Christmas gifts because they remember the magazine yeah. um, fondly and, and have folks who maybe miss the magazine or, you know, never saw mm -hmm. it or whatever. Mm -hmm. The other book that I have, um, which is dear to my heart, I, I uh, self-published through Lulu and it's a little um, pocket book. I should have had them ready for you, but okay. it's like this big. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's like this big. It literally will fit in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. um, and there are just a few essays in there. Um, these essays were um, part of my thesis work, my master's degree work. Um, and they had been uh, accepted to online literary magazines. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so dear to my heart and during my um during my my mfa and my graduate work i was focusing on um empathy um how do you create empathy for dark characters how do you create empathy in your reader's mind how do you cover uh difficult topics with empathy so the the name of my little pocketbook is just simply called essays on empathy mm -hmm. um you can go to my lhaysmini.net website and or you can go to lulu and type my name in and you know uh life in the sloan lane is available on barnes and noble it's available on amazon of course i get very little yeah. money if they are sold that route yeah, I, Amazon I make good money if, these days. Yeah, I'm, I make more money if they're sold from Lulu. But my mm -hmm. little pocketbook is a size that Barnes and Noble and Amazon won't accept. Oh. So it doesn't have an ISBN number. It's just, it, again, it's just a little pocketbook mm -hmm. that you can only get through me personally or through Lulu or my website. Mm -hmm. I like, um, I like that size. And, and, um, there's, um, there's a little publication called, um, creative. It's put out by creative nonfiction magazine. And it's one little essay that comes in a pocket book. Uh, it was suspended during COVID and the pandemic. It's going to come back out, but I loved that. Because I could stick it in my little pocket in my purse. I could stick it in mm -hmm. my back pocket. And it was more mobile than, and you know, my purse is not big enough for a regular size book. It only has, but I always have to have reading material <laughs> with me. Mine's, mine's big enough for a regular size encyclopedia set. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I have, no, a, I can't I have a bag. I don't have a purse. I have a bag. I carry it. <laughs> So I do, you know, I have written other books. I've written other books about spirituality. Um, mm -hmm. I have a book. Um, it, it's a little, it's a little trippy. It's, it's about um, reading people's minds, but all of that is, is science. It's not magic. Mm -hmm. It's science, mm -hmm. right? It's nonverbal communication. It's right. micro expressions. It's, you know, what generation are they? What year were they born? That mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So it 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 it's presented as it, like how to be psychic. Yeah, but kind of Sherlock Holmes. It really Holmes. is. Yeah, it really is. Um, that's I just I call it simply psychic. Mm. Um, but I maybe I should have named it scientifically psychic or or something like that. <laughs> and that was something that I did. Um originally what i did when i worked at hampton ridge magic and here we go all the way back to 20 years ago yeah. <clears throat> when i worked for them magic books were the magic trick books that were available in the late 90s were from mimeograph oh yeah i remember mimeograph. i mean okay for yeah. you youngins go google it you know oh yeah so i don't even know if google goes back that far the other thing <laughs> Right. So even even then, I was taking um, things that were no longer copyrighted 
or with permission. And we were taking these old black and white plastic spiral bound mimeographed books and turning them into updating them and turning them into modern presentation, full color cover, mm -hmm. um, nice font type thing. And when they moved to Chicago, you know, I didn't get rid of my files. I still had my files. And of course, when, when that book, it, it was, it, it was originally called pyrotechnics or psychotechnics or so I don't even remember, but you know, at, when that was originally written, micro expressions weren't, um, a commonly known thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, part of nonverbal communication requires empathy. Y you mm -hmm. have to be able to look at a person and, and read them as well as hear them, mm -hmm. you know, so some of them, that one was just for fun. You know, we were in quarantine. I was sorting through my file cabinets. I came across that one and I was like, Ooh, I bet that could be updated and brought to newfangled. Cause again, you know, like even if you wanted to be presenting as a psychic and you wanted to market yourself as a psychic, it was like, go hang doorknob tags on their doors. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, it was Gorilla so pre internet <laughs> that, yeah, it was just, you know, it was so outdated. I, I, I really just wanted to bring that one up to date. So again, I, I have multiple books. But the two that I, I think are most appropriate for a wide audience are the is life in the slow lane, and then my little um, essays on empathy. Um, that little pocket book, I, I just love that little book, and I should probably redo the cover because um, all my covers were created with um, a cover designer that Lulu provides. Okay. But they recently, um, they recently updated their cover designer. But I've been using Lulu, oh, wow, since oof, possibly since you and I first encountered each other. My first I, I thing I did on there. I remember reading about Lulu back in the early 2000s. And I did, I, I did a book on um, uh, Think Outside the Office. And I, I went with Outskirt Press at the time and uh, instead them. of lulu so i think they're still well, out I there had, that i've never done anything like that since my first book that i did with lulu again i don't i have to redo it now it's been up there so old and i've taken it down it was a picture book for audra state park mm -hmm. frank and i used to go to audra state park all the time and we would go uh winter spring summer fall audra mm -hmm. is the first to open up in the season and the last to close um, campground wise, but you can again, still go hike there or whatever in the winter. So mm -hmm. between the two of us, we had several floppy disks full <laughs> of photography that we had taken on our visits to Audra state park. And I, I love Audra. It's so beautiful there. Um, and so, I mean, years ago, I'm thinking probably early 2000s, mm -hmm. I did a photo book of, um, other state park and that's probably the first one that i did through lulu now the very first book i published i published in sixth grade um i typed it up on my mother's manual typewriter on onion skin paper yes I and i i illustrated it myself with pencils and crayons I sewed the binding on my mother's sewing machine <laughs> and I made a cardboard cover that I covered with feed sack fabric, um, red feed sack fabric with white polka dots. And then I took stencils and put the title on the front. So, I mean, you know, I've just been, doing what i do since yeah. i was a kid a and now walk. i've got like you know nine typewriters in my house that i'm doing you know typewriter i i will uh, on, and all that kind of other stuff on, on a little little dog leg or rabbit hole or rabbit trail or whatever you call it at this point i will blame you for several little um 
<laughs> Several and bypass I already know. <laughs> <laughs> because you did the thing with the typewriters. I'm like, oh my God, I love those typewriters. So I have like three. I didn't nowhere near like you do, but we have three and we have one that was my husband's father's when he was in high school, but it's a, it's an, it's like a, it's like a 1918, 1920 typewriter. But when my husband's, when my father-in-law was in high school, he bought it used. So it wasn't like new in the family. And we took it to, right. I'm going to say Cincinnati to a guy out in Cincinnati and had it as refurbished as could be done with it. It was in pretty rough shape, but, um, and so we've got it out on a table on a little little um, area that I have some other period things like that in in the in the here in the breakfast room, and then I have a couple of manuals downstairs that the husband doesn't know about <laughs> that I got, and they come in when he wasn't here. He was out of state at different times, and they come in, and then um, there's something else. Okay, there was a couple other. Uh, uh, little hobbies I I dived in for short periods of time because I'm like, oh, look what Lisa's doing. Oh, I want to do that, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, and actually, Substack's one of them. Substack's one of them. Uh, well, thought, what is Substack? That what was, is that? Oh, I got to know what this is. So, yes, I had to I had to see that too, and and um, I think it was uh, what is it? Black by God. Uh, Crystal Good does her Black by God magazine on. Mm -hmm. Substack, I think originally she did. And then every, you know, I think quarterly she does a print version of it. Mm -hmm. But there are several um, West Virginia endeavors happening on Substack. Ones that I follow that are either citizen uh, journalism or um, I, I follow one that, you know, she talks about, you know, dealing with, um, your own insecurities mm -hmm. or, you know, the imposter syndrome or things right. like that. So again, I, I simply saw other people doing it and I was like, yeah. what Substack? you know, cause I, yeah. again, I love yeah. WordPress started yeah. designing on front page, you know, um, I but then, and I love WordPress, little, but sub, Substack makes it so easy. They do. And the so shame easy. of it is, is that, you know, I've got like, uh, I've got, the personal website and I've got to put up the, I, I've been using a subdomain on my web, website for direct books for the B and B, but I need, I need to off that onto its own. And I've, I've got the domain. I just haven't built the site yet, but the, the sad part about that is, as you, as you build your website to have your, your blog to drive the traffic to your website to, you know, for all of that. And when you're doing Substack, you're, you're absolutely, you've got people far and away from, from, unless and then you try to drive them back to you and so that's I love the idea of Substack it really is that simple but and it beats having to log in behind and trying to upload a blog post and all that nonsense um, but it 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 takes you away from you know so I, I can publish all this stuff and, and set it up to be published on Substack which really I should be putting on my own website blog you know, I get that. I think about that too, because, you know, the, the purpose of all of it is really to, you know, typical marketing is to mm -hmm. funnel people to your website. Right. Now, uh, you know, I have the same issue with social media. I yeah. don't want people following my personal Facebook profile. I want them to follow my author profile, but right. my author profile is there to send them to either my Substack or my website. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I believe, and again, this is my personal preference. I, um, I like receiving things in my email that I can leave in that inbox and access whenever I have time right. or inclination or mindset. Now on social media, if you don't check it every day, or if you, you know, you might miss something or you mm -hmm. might, you know, if you saw it today, Facebook makes it hard to go back and find it five yeah, days from now because you already saw it ones, and they don't yeah. show it. If you don't save it for watch later and then have that big list. Yeah. Some of the big, uh, the big social media are just getting uh, <laughs> too big for their britches. I mean, they're just um, what started out is as, as 
great fun ways to connect or reconnect and to share stuff is now become a place where you're hesitant to even tell somebody you disagree with them. So right. uh, it, it's just getting crazy. And I see, I don't have so much going on over at YouTube that I worry about it, but I'm seeing people get, get, and I'm not, mon I'm, not I'm not monetized there anyway. I don't have enough of anything to do, mon but I'm seeing people get, um, you know, demonetized or they're getting um, uh, slowed down and, and, and hidden and stuff because they have a different opinion of something. And it's just, it's, I, I, I see this, whatever it has become, it's getting ready to crumble back down on itself. And I, I don't know where people go from there to stay connected because we're so personally human to human disconnected now. It's, it's all, it's all about, you know, if you're sitting here playing on your phone, it's all about, um, you know, sitting in a, Wayne and I will be sitting in the living room watching, te well, we're not really watching television, but the television's on, the dogs are asleep and he's over here doing this on his phone and I'm over here doing this on my phone. And I might say, oh, it's going to rain tomorrow. Yeah, I got, you know, I got to get whatever done. And, but there, we're losing, we've lost that. And I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what's about to happen, but it can't be good. And I don't mean like revolution. I don't mean anything cr like that, but as far as society, we 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 don't talk to each. We don't look people in the eye anymore. We don't know how to have conversation anymore. Next up, we have my interview with Toolman Tim himself and his wife Becky. I have to tell you, that interview was a fun two hours, and it was hard to be able to find something to trim out from it. I hope you enjoy it. Really, it says yeah. ready to go live. Hmm. Now it says live. live. Oh. It just came up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't think we were live. That's well. crazy. Hey, guys. <laughs> We've been talking. I didn't even see that. Oh, that might be part of the problem. And I'm yeah. not going <laughs> to. I'm not going to see that. That was that's user yeah. error. That's just where I'm just not. Oh, yeah. We had a grand conversation. So. Yes, we did. It's a shame they missed it. Now, and now we got to go. It's over. No, it's yep. not. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I won't subject everybody to that music again. That's all right. I'll put it back in later because I know you can split the audio off. And that's the podcast intro. So that's uh, neither here nor there. So, oh, my gosh. Let's see. Anyone out there? That's funny. See, these are all your people. They're always around. Love them. I did. Um, I did get into your um, your uh, Telegram. Yes. Yeah, I seen that. Yeah, great. To have oh my you. gosh, I popped it open a little while ago. It was like seventy four things. I can't keep up with all of that. That's right. And, that, and ours. You should see the survival podcast one. I won't go oh. in for two days, and there'll be two thousand messages. I'm like, nah, it's good. Uh, and I'll see, I don't. You. I have I have zero of the notifications turned on on any of my social media just because yep. it would blow my phone up all day long. So even no more than I'm on stuff and I'm on all kinds of them. some of the older, some of the bigger, older ones. And then so a few of the newer ones I've got accounts with, but I, I don't do a whole lot with yet. I'm not sure that's where I need to be on all of them, although I have an account set up. But so let's do this. Um, sure. I know that uh, that. Uh, my friends know me and your friends know you, but my friends don't know either of you. And so if you'll both uh, uh, introduce yourself a little bit for, for a couple of minutes, tell us a little bit about um, uh, what you do, what you don't do. <laughs> sure. Well, she's going to do all the talking tonight. So no, I just think that would put her right fine. You know, that's fine. I know. You know. I know. She, yeah. So I, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm Tim Cook, otherwise known as Toolman Tim on YouTube. Uh -huh. Facebook, TikTok, the podcast feed, whatever, you know, so you might have seen my ugly mug talking about generators or DeWalt tools at some point. I'm um, on the Expert Council of Survival podcast. And yeah, we talk about preparedness, repairedness, all of that jazz. And this is my beautiful wife, Becky, next to me. She joins me on occasion on the podcast. Hey, babe. Yep. She uh, got me out of a jam a couple of weeks ago. We had a very last minute guest cancellation. Mm -hmm. So she came on and we talked about Christmas. So I awesome. listened to that. I did. Yeah. I, that was a good one. I was glad that, for that we one. planned that in about a half an hour. That yeah. was about all we had. We, uh, I was like, it's either I don't go or I go. And I, I'm definitely committed to my Sunday night live beyond anything else. So, well, you have to be. And that's, um, 
that's a challenge for me is trying to find the spot where it's going to work regularly. Yep. So, but Becky, t t tell us yep. some about you. Well, a little bit. Uh, well, we've been married forever, yep. I guess you could say. <laughs> we've got five kids. Uh, okay. They're 25, 23, 21, and then we have 12 year old twins. And I own a daycare with my sister that we opened up actually going on almost two and a half. Yeah. Right, almost three years ago. Right now. in the middle of COVID. Right so. in the middle of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so her and I were entrepreneurs and, and we just, uh, they, we, I work every day at the daycare and sure. come, come home and I help him with his business and with the more, well, I wouldn't say so much of a handyman thing now that between October and March is just basically snow and property management. and property management. There's really no time for any handyman. Cause like since beginning part of November, I don't think the snow has stopped. It's just ridiculous. Um, but that's, that's pretty much about it. Yeah. Like we, we've had about two feet of snow so far this year. Yeah. Uh, this morning I got up, it was minus 31. And for those who want it in freedom units, that is basically minus 31 because at minus 40, <laughs> They meet. So it was, I don't care when you get that far down in the minuses, it's friggin' cold. It was, so. yeah, that's just dumb. Why, <laughs> why does anybody want to live in that? I, I don't, I don't know. Make and good for, money with snow. So yeah, that, that's yeah. And you guys yeah. are in Alberta. Yeah. Oh that's, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. So what, what some of my, uh, some of my preparedness friends call uh, Northern North Dakota. That's where we are. So, uh, which is actually Alberta, Canada. And uh, we just bought 10 acres outside of Camden, Tennessee. So that is our uh, away property, yes. you know, so. Make a little vacation, a little down south, because that's yeah. in the United States, that's considered down south. It's there, not, yes. the, it's not the deep south, but it's down south. It's I don't so, think I'd want to go deep south. It, it's south enough for us. Yeah, and south we have, enough for me. Yeah. We have so many like-minded friends in that area. We're yeah. really excited. You know, I would say yeah. at some point, well, anywhere. Well, we, we can't live down there no. because... Canada has this thing. If you're gone for six months, then you basically lose everything, yeah. like all your pensions and everything like yeah. that. So, and then, and then of course, then it's a, a hassle with healthcare and everything. So, Cause yeah. where we have the healthcare up here, they take away your health card and everything. And I'm like, we, we can't lose that. No, no. So yeah. basically be down for like five months and uh, 28 days or something. Yeah. And we'll so come back up <laughs> so. half a year minus one day. Is yeah. What we yeah. Can there's, do. there's something like that in yeah. the U S and it, it may be worldwide for the more developed nations. I I'm not sure, but a friend of my father, um, he goes uh, to Asia and oh, he yeah. lives, he lives down in there for X amount of time, but he has to come back every so often mm -hmm. and stay for yeah. a period of time. And then before he can go back or his citizenship is in jeopardy and stuff. I don't know. Well, I, I don't, yeah, no, as much as we'd love to live down in the States, we've basically worked since we were like 18. Yeah. <laughs> sure, oh, yeah. Darn, that government's not taking my pension. From me, <laughs> so. Well, and you know, I, yeah. and I'm, I'm not trying to jinx you. I'm not trying to discourage yeah. you, but it's, it's a, it is a different lifestyle. And once you're down here for a while, you might not be, you know, it might not be your cup of yeah. tea. So, uh, yeah, but well, our, then our again, big thing is it's going to be, it's a vacation property until it needs to be more than a vacation property. Right. You know what right. I mean? So, yeah. Well, and plus a vacation property for our family and mm -hmm. friends too. If they want sure. to go down. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to get away from all of that snow. I just, uh, my, uh, my mother's sister lived in Cleveland for most of her adult oh, life. And, you know, just, they get, would get that lake effect. And of course they would probably not as much snow as you guys get, but it just a tremendous amount of snow every year. And I just, I, I just, my bones hurt when it snows and it gets that cold. And I don't, well, I'm, I'm okay where I'm at. I, it gets cold. I mean, bitter cold, maybe, a total of two weeks, not necessarily <laughs> in a row, but well, know. believe it or not, though, when you're living near the lakes, because I grew up in Ontario, which was right across from yeah. Port Huron, Michigan, um, they can get like minus to actually feels oh, colder yeah. than it does out here because yeah. it's more of a wet cold and it so it goes right to your bones. Yeah, here it's a dry cold, you could be outside and you're like, oh, it's cold, but as soon as you go in, you warm up. But yeah. with that wet cold, you don't warm up as easy as you do out here. Yeah, and they get yeah, way more snow than we do. Yeah. That lake effect, yeah. We, you know, this is 
odd for us to have two feet this time of year. So it's, yeah, we, it, because it's so dry, we're kind of a, I wouldn't call it a desert climate, but pretty damn close, you know? Yeah. And so we don't get a ton of moisture. We've actually been in a drought for, oh, I don't know, a couple of years now, uh, you know? So anytime we get snow, it helps, but yeah, we, we don't get the precipitation mm -hmm. that the coast get for sure. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's uh, so. No, I, um, I do. I listen. You go ahead. I think we have a delay there. Sorry, Robin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just uh, the, yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, I I listen. I I put I have a um. Let's see if it's here. It's on the charge, but <clears throat> I'll unplug it because of course it's a it's a Bluetooth headband. Oh, cool! And, and it's got uh, oh, it's got is. speakers in them. Amazon, you know, Amazon's yeah. got everything. Um, and what I do is I'll I'll wear this all the time, and I'll it's it's paired up with my Kindle and my phone, but mostly I do I listen to the YouTube's on the Kindle. Okay. And I'll it'll be, you know, it it's got a pretty good range. I can pretty much do whatever I need to through the house and not lose the signal from it. Um, and so I'll I'll stream yours and I'll stream um Jacks and I'll stream John and I'll stream Nicole and I'll stream a bunch of other ones like all day. And I'm just li like you do audio books and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just listening to them while I'm doing all my, all my stuff. And so um, I've, I've probably caught up on everybody in the, in the few months that I've been listening, probably years worth of stuff and the bonds and um, mm. oh, I was trying to think of who else. Um, Billy is so good. I, I just got to know <laughs> Billy maybe six months ago and he is mm -hmm. oh that is one smart well him and his son so good so so i yeah i could i could, and i could listen to him when i first heard him talk i'm like he has a voice for radio and he's and had he, radio track yeah exactly yeah. he was an am talk radio guy and i think that's mm -hmm. why him and i got along so well because i there's just something i always love talk radio spent years as a kid listening to it and yeah. you know probably listening to stuff i didn't even understand but I just always had talk radio on in the background, you know, and always enjoyed it. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little older than you are. And, and back in the day when, um, when I was young, I, I had a little transistor um, and, and I could pick up WLS out of Chicago nice. and I'd, I'd listen to it at, at night, you know, when it's yeah. all that signal travels so much further and I'd listen to it. But um, I did, uh, it was, it was just once a week, but it was about four months of a local AM talk um, back in, um, oh shoot, I want to say 2005, 2004, nice. 2005. Um, one of our, um, local school board officials was running for reelection and he had a regular spot on the local show. And so when they're actively campaigning, running for election, they can't sure, that makes be sense. on that show. So, um, the guy that was the, it, it was his talk show and the school board guy was the co-host. And so he was looking for somebody and, and um, we had some mutual friends and, and we were all out and run into each other. And um, he said, you want to do it? I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> that would be fun. I don't know. But it, it was, it was very interesting to be in the studio and, and to see how things were working. I wasn't, I mean, and I did get paid. So technically I guess I was a professional, but <laughs> <laughs> um it was, it just, it was very interesting to see what was happening, you know, because when you just have the radio on, you don't see all the stuff behind the scenes and it's not sure. like television because you can't see the, 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 uh, DJs and the, uh, announcers and this, and, and the, uh, program managers and all that stuff. And so it was, it was very interesting to, to, uh, to, to do that. Plus I got paid for it. Plus I was taking vacation time off of my regular job. So I was getting paid twice. <laughs> Double bit right on. <laughs> for three, three hours a week. So it was, it was really interesting. Met a lot of interesting people had a lot of, um, um, heated debate. They, yeah. Sure. Cause it was a very political political show <laughs> so am radio tends to be that down here so yes it does yeah, it's and, up here and, too so. and I'm, I'm very opinionated on many things and not afraid to tell people that but uh yeah it was it was fun like i said i did that for from mid-january to the first part of may so it was nice. it was a blast well so now that we've we've uh, got all that out of the way um 
part of the reason that I asked you to do this was to uh, talk a little bit about some of the basic tools that, and I'm focusing on the, from the female perspective, obviously, I know guys, some guys have this ingrained um, because you're guys, <laughs> you know, and, and you grow up knowing all this stuff or hearing all this stuff and it comes second nature. And, you know, for some of us females, it doesn't, um, I, I was in the split. Um, my dad didn't, didn't see, you know, girls didn't learn all of this stuff, but a few years after, you know, uh, I, I got grown, then it was all, you know, girls were being taught all this stuff and sure. going to shop class and all that stuff. So I was kind of in that uh, transition period, but um, I wanted to ask you to, uh, for some of your um, thoughts about what uh, tools women need to have in the home to take care of some, you know, minor uh, emergency things. Uh, that, that may arise, especially through the winter time and, and also in their vehicles. And then I think I mentioned to you that I would be interested in getting Becky's opinion as to whether she thinks there's something different that that sh you might need, because, you know, we yeah. do things differently sometimes. And um, while, you know, putting a picture on the wall with a hammer is kind of generic, everybody needs a hammer and a nail to put a picture on the wall. Maybe there's something else that we, oh, there we might handle oh, differently. Oh, we got something we use that is way better than a hammer and nail. So I'll save that for the end, but we do. High so. heel shoes is probably oh, it. No, no, I'll tell you, it's good. But I gotta, so let me start with, we have five kids, four of whom are girls. Our first one is a boy, Mackenzie, and the next four, Olivia, Grace, Charlotte, and Alice, all girls. And we have done our damnedest to make sure that they are independent. So mm -hmm. Olivia, you know, as soon as she started driving, I, I had her out changing her tires, learning a bit about changing oil, probably give her a little too much confidence because she's, she's got herself in over her head a few times, but I'd rather go that <laughs> way than the opposite, right? Grace, lover, she just, a tool's never scared her, has it? She yeah. just loves it. I So when I... I'm going to uh, give a confession here. So, you know, I'm a DeWalt person, but when I first really got into the DeWalt, I had a Milwaukee drill set. And so Gracie inherited my Milwaukee drill. She uses it all the time. She is so good with that. And the younger ones, we're going to, they're, they're, yeah, they're coming along. Yeah. So, but I don't know, have you ever heard of pink tax? So basically what it is, is that Products for women cost on average oh, yes. more. Yeah. Yes. So okay, yes. here's my thing. I used to work at uh, what we call home hardware up here. It's a big hardware store. Mm -hmm. And my, it there would always be, it was usually for breast cancer or something. There would always be something bright pink, whether it was a hammer or a um, multi-bit screwdriver that was um, positioned for women. And it was always a piece of junk. Always. You know, they, to me, it looked like they just used it as an excuse. They painted some piece of crap. They couldn't sell pink and they right. say, here, it's for women. So mm -hmm. my thing is I give a lot of thought to this, this week, put some notes together, but my big thing was for the most part, a basic home toolbox for anybody, whether it's a man or a woman or somebody just moving out, the basics are about the same. You know, some things change, you know, if you have smaller hands or, you know, whatever, whether it's a smaller man or a smaller woman, whatever, you might want a lighter hammer, you know, that kind of stuff. But, but overall, I would say that the basics are about the same. What do you think, baby? Nope. They are. Um, now I, I find, well, going back to the girls. Yeah. Uh, when I was growing up, it was my myself then my brother then my younger sister and there's a quite a, there's like a four and a half year gap between my brother and myself mm -hmm. and when i met tim i knew more about vehicles than he did absolutely because my, <laughs> I, my dad taught me everything and and i think a lot of it was because he just didn't want me calling him every day <laughs> about something and and right from when i was eight i'd say he's seven, eight years old, I was in the garage with him, helping put motors in, changing tires, using tools, using all kinds of that stuff. And, and I grew up when, when we had our first daughter, I was like, okay, no, my, my girls are going to know how to do everything. Yep. And even without tools, like Olivia, you could put her in the middle of the woods. She knows oh, yeah. how to butcher a pig. She knows how to butcher chickens. 
um, she'd be the she'd be the one that definitely <laughs> would survive in the woods longer than our son would. Oh yeah, 100%. <laughs> I think our son would just crawl up in a ball and start crying. <laughs> but where's my Gatorade? Yeah, where's my Gatorade and my Xbox? But uh, <laughs> she, but like all our girls, they're we're, we want them to be independent, and but with the tools, I do find. Uh, like with the basics, it, like, for example, with, with Tim's hammer, I can't use his hammer. Right, because right? it's a big because, ass old 20 ounce hammer. And it, it's too heavy for me. And, yeah. and I, and, um, and I find even trying to hit it, like, I, I can't even get the strength to hit it. And so like, I have to use the smaller hammers, but I yeah. find the fiberglass ones are a lot nicer. No vibration. There's no vibration. Cause like with the issues, like with like you get the cramping in your hands and mm -hmm. but I find the wood one just it just kills your fingers and most women always I don't know when they get about my age they always have issues with your hands <laughs> it's, it's I don't know if it's a thing like and of course the cold makes it worse and oh, yeah. and and of course when we opened up the daycare my um my brother-in-law thought he was being cute and he brought Amy and I a pink multi-bit screwdriver he's like oh look i went and bought it for you it was like it was like 18 dollars <laughs> and he's like oh and it's fancy pink <laughs> no word of a lie we use that twice and it and it like i'm just like him i break everything <laughs> so it's like, and it broke and i was like this yeah. is the biggest piece of junk out there and so like now we we just use a basic screwdriver and and even some of his screwdrivers are too heavy for me so yeah like i yeah. wish they had something that was more catered for smaller hands, but I find just lightweight ones. That's what I find works a lot better for me. It's fun okay. to let her talk because anything I say comes off as sexist. So, <laughs> so no, like, nah. no, I don't I work that way. I know, I, I know there's a lot of people who do, but I, 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 I don't. So I'm like, because you know, there's I'm some like, real, okay, well, if you have tiny little hands, that's you know, right. That's right. Well, yeah. and, and I, and another thing too, like with, um, I find, the impact drivers they scare me and i think it's because it's it's a newer tool yeah and there's so much and there's every, so much power there's there. so much power and yeah. i can't seem to find that sweet spot and i think every screw i put in last summer with that impact driver i yes! stripped i stripped yeah. the head on it because i, I and, and i'm just like and i'm full full tilt zero to 60 and then boom yeah. it strips boom it yeah. strips um and of course and then you don't realize how powerful it is and then you touch it and i i singed my hand a couple right, times yes. on it and so i'm not a huge fan of the De of the dewalt impact driver like even though i know it's an incredible tool but unless you know what like the power but I find men where they have the bigger finger, they have more control over that. But with well, me, and they like, they have the arms, the arm strength. There's some biological differences that we just yeah. can't overcome. And they men have you know the upper arm strength and the arm strength and the hand strength that that we just you know we we don't have naturally uh, as exactly. a rule. Exactly. One and, thing I gotta um, get you that I haven't mm -hmm. yet. Rachel Brown in the comments said that uh, she likes her cordless tools and her cordless screwdriver. Mm -hmm. And so, for a lot of people with smaller hands, the cordless screwdrivers are a great option. And there's, mm -hmm. I gotta get one and test them out for people because they're they're in between a drill, an impact driver. You know, they're they they look like a little lock picking gun. You know, they're about right. yay big, mm -hmm. and you can hold them, and they'll put a screw in no problem all day long. But they don't have all that torque that, strip. that little Miss Cook here loves to turn from zero to 140. And then, then she'll be like, honey, I didn't get it in all the way. Can you fix it? And I'm like, well, or can you take it out? It's in the wrong spot. The, the, this, all the square is now a circle and I need a hammer or a, a multi-tool to cut it off. So, yeah. yeah. Or, or one of those. Um, um, Oh, I forget what they're called, but you you, you the, tap them into the screw. The drill out. Or, yeah. Tap yeah, to, yeah. Yeah. To, oh, to, take it, to back them out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it happens, yeah. you know. But yeah, one thing I should say before I go too far, and and I preach this. I, I did a presentation at uh, Prepper Camp on home maintenance, repairedness is what I call it. So mm -hmm. help, you know, maintenance for help when or when help isn't around the corner, and and that's how it works no matter what. But the first thing everybody needs to do is have a central location, like a toolbox or a junk drawer. But you need to have oh a place for your tools. How I many know. of those do you need? Oh, I've Jesus, got like many. three junk yeah. junk drawers and two. I think I have like two boxes. <laughs> so and those are just mine. Big, those don't count big, his. 
I have big freezer bags with everything in it. Oh, I have a few of those too. Yeah. Oh, it's awful. I have a few yeah. of them. If you have a fire and you can't find your, even if you've got 12 fire extinguishers, but you can't mm -hmm. find one of them, you might as well right. not have any, right? So exactly. if you need a screw, you know, if you need to put a screw in a wall or you need to pull a nail out or, I mean, heaven help you, say you need a wrench to turn off the water main because you went to go turn off your water main and all of a sudden the damn thing come off in your hand, right? Mm. So if you need that and you can't find your tool, you might as well not have the tool, right? Yeah. yeah so a exactly. um, few years back when I just started my business, my brother-in-law for Christmas got me one of these. It's kind of a plastic metal hybrid toolbox, about yay big. And uh, so every, I have what I call my grab and go toolbox. And mm -hmm. whenever I go for a, a service call or a handyman job, that toolbox and my drill bag goes with me because as long as I put my tools back, I know where they are. And so right. if there's an emergency, whether it's mm -hmm. for you, like that time we had a flare up on the barbecue and you knew where the fire spray was, or I have to go and shut off the water quickly at a rental. The first thing I know is I have everything here. I can grab it and go. And so no matter what you have with your tools, the first thing, it's the same as having, say, we have, I have a couple of flashlights in my bedside table. So if the power goes out, I know where the flashlights are. And mm -hmm. if you need to fix something or solve an issue, the first thing is to have a central location, wherever that might be for sure. Yeah. And for women, that would be a junk drawer. Yes. And that's why I <laughs> because, that, because, so. every, because every woman that is listening right now. Oh yeah. I, I, I where or you will never, in the future. <laughs> you ever, never remember where you put anything, right? I, I never so remember. One of the things that I really, I don't know why I didn't think about it before, but one of the things that I should have done when I first started this, either in episode one or two, was to share with you some information on one of my uh, best girlfriends, Diana Mace. Diane, it, it, I've known her since, gosh, before my younger son was born. I've known her since about 1987. And uh, we were um, our uh, family support group uh, officers together when uh, I was married to my first husband. And uh, he was, sta I say stationed, he was actually active duty. But he um, was at the uh, Dunbar National Guard Armory. Um, back in the 80s, obviously, late 80s. So uh, Diane and I worked together along with some other ladies uh, to rebuild the family support group that was there. They had had one years before. It had fallen by the wayside, as these things sometimes do. And Diane and I... Um, helped to gather the ladies together and, and we worked some bake sales and raised money and, and things to, to um, provide Christmas gifts and a Christmas party and a summer picnic and just different stuff like that, that you do when you're in these support groups. Um, and we held uh, educational events. We, um, uh, we would, we would invite the ladies in to get their ID cards. Those, because even if you're a national guard spouse, you you can get a, a an ID card. You're limited on how you can use it, but you can get a, an ID card so that you know during um, well that's the way it used to be during drill weekends and annual uh, training and stuff like that. You could go to the commissary or the PX. We don't well we have a I haven't been out there in thirty years. Uh, at that time we had a small PX about the size of a convenience store small convenience store gas station type so um but we did we did a lot of good work and then um my former husband was transferred down to um williamson and he worked down there in southern west virginia just across the river from kentucky and uh we did diane ended up down there as well but at that point her husband bob had gone to uh, officer school officer candidate school and was a lieutenant and um we worked together doing the same kind of stuff down there and we helped to <laughs> and some of the guys got really mad at us too because they were used to having those weekends to themselves they told their wives it was a voluntary thing i mean there's a whole i there's a whole episode right there there is a whole episode right there but anyway, so some of the guys got mad that we were telling the women, number one, that the guys got paid, and number two, that they were eligible for military ID cards. 
and the benefits and all the things that go along with serving in the National Guard. But um, so I've known Diane a long time and she's been one of my long time good friends. And um, she has been diagnosed with a, um, a disease called non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis, if I pronounced that correctly. It's it's kind of like having, um, oh, alcoholic cirrhosis, except there's no alcohol involved. She's not a drinker, never has been. And um, so, her, but uh, they abbreviate it as NASH, N-A-S-H. And um, as it worsens, you know, you can't live without your liver. So as it worsens, her weight goes down. She can't eat her. She's just lethargic. There's a whole lot. Oh, just a whole lot of things that um, you don't think about. You don't think about because most of us never have to deal with those kind of things. Um, and she is at the point now where she absolutely has to have a liver transplant. Now, as odd as that sounds, the liver will regenerate. It will grow back. And if you are the proper blood type, and in Diane's case, it would be an O negative or O positive blood type, you can donate. What they do is they take a portion of your liver. They don't take your entire liver. They take a portion of your liver and donate it to the individual. If it's a child, they take a small portion. If it's an adult, though, they take a pretty hefty piece. And uh, yours will grow back. And ideally, her body won't reject the, the donor. And... Um, you know, she'll be able to get a little bit of normalcy back in her life in a, a more traditional lifespan. Now, um, I did, I wouldn't ask you to do something I don't do. Um, I did reach out to University of Virginia, which is where she is assigned to work through. And they have a live organ donor program. And I've put a link down in the show notes for that. And I contacted the lady out there that's working with Diana. And I said, uh, you know, I want to try this. She said, are you sure? I said, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think I could live with myself if I didn't. She's been a good friend to me for a long time. And I mean, <laughs> you know, here we go. So I went through, I, I filled out everything that had to be filled out. Um, and then I had some lab works done and gave them permission to um, check my medical history. And some of the medications I take for some of the issues I have, plus my age. Now, I wasn't technically beyond the cutoff for the age. I think 60 is the cutoff, if I remember. But the, the upper level of my age combined with some of the medications that I had to take um, threw me out. I really actually thought I was in pretty good health which I am, but not for that. So uh, part of that program, so if you were to uh, volunteer to be a donor and you passed all the checks and you, um, you were approved, what happens is her insurance, her medical insurance pays your expenses related to the organ donation. So your travel for medical tests and such things to University of Virginia, or maybe another one for all I know. I mean, you may be able to do it somewhere. I, I don't know if you have to be right down there or not, because I didn't get that far. Um, your travel, your room and board while you're there, all hospital related expenses related to the operation and everything your travel back for follow-up if there's required any, uh, medications if you need any related to the transplant. Uh, all of that's covered by Diane's insurance, not you, not the donor. So she's been on the transplant list for over a year now, and she can even, if it's the right blood type and um, the right conditions, she can even have the a donated liver from a cadaver, but that that's getting kind of, well, you know, COVID, one of the things, one of the terrible things about all those lockdowns that you don't think about, people not traveling as much, there's not as many fatal 
vehicle accidents and therefore a smaller supply of donated organs. And that's really kind of cold to think about. I, the first time I thought about that, I thought, man, that's just terrible. But I don't want to call it an industry because it's not like somebody goes out there and forces you to have a wreck so that it kills you so that you have to donate your organs. But there is a market. Is that the best word? I don't even know if market's the best word, but um, you know, that's why they encourage you to be an organ donor and have it on your um, ID card so that if something like that happens, you died at the scene, died shortly after at the hospital or something, they check the card, you're an organ donor, no time is wasted, and you could save other lives. So with fewer people traveling and all that, you, you get the idea. I don't have to go along. I, I'm not talking to kindergartners here, and I don't mean to pretend that I am. But sometimes I do ramble. So, um, you know, if she also has a uh, GoFundMe and I don't, I don't, I know people, there are people who despise GoFundMe. I get it. This isn't about me or your opinion of GoFundMe. Diana chose GoFundMe for a reason, probably because it was the most familiar one to her and one of the most well-known at the time she created it. Throwing all the political issues aside. Uh, she does have a GoFundMe. She could use more donations because this keeps dragging out. Her insurance does not reimburse her travel and meals to go to the doctor. So when she has to go to the University of Virginia for checkups and follow-ups and tests and all these things, her room and board, her meals, none of that's covered by her insurance. It's coming out of her pocket. So, um, you know, any if you are of the mind to contribute a couple bucks um i would rather actually you dropped five bucks in her gofundme than to you know drop five bucks worth of satoshis or heck five cents worth of satoshis so i mean you can be anonymous if you want you can out yourself if you want you can say robin told me to on the fountain.fm app you know, Robin gave up her Satoshis for you to have, you know, gas money. I, I don't really care. I, I would rather you did that. I really would. Um, I just would rather you, and I have, I have donated some cash to her, you know, in person cash to her and some cash to GoFundMe to help um, spin that up a little bit. And my son has, and uh, some other folks have, but um, she's at the point now where she's, she's needing in a little more cash to cover some of the bills. So again, you know, I, um, I went through, I was ready to do it. I mean, it was going to be kind of a challenge. I was really scared to death, but um, when they told me you're not a, you're not a good match. I just absolutely, I was heart, I was heartbroken. I just, I just couldn't believe it. I was really upset for, for several days. If you know of other people, if you, Please share her story around and say, you know, would you consider dropping a couple bucks here for her? That would be great. She's been a wonderful, faithful wife to her husband, Bob. She has been a faithful mother and loving mother to her children who have each in their own way, um, even as adult children, had some challenges that she had to help them through. Um, and her grandson, who for a little while she, uh, she had guardianship over while there was some difficulties going on. So, I mean, she is a selfless person, really. And uh, I, I hate to see her in this condition. So please check that link down below. Not only just um, her GoFundMe, but also the University of Virginia's link to the organ donor, organ donor site. Thank you. Thank you for even thinking about it, really. And for those of you who pray, pray. Please pray for her. I hope you enjoyed your time with me today. If you're interested in more information, you can go to RobinHolstein.com. You can look me up on all the major social media platforms and all the major podcast platforms. And don't forget, I prefer Fountain.fm.
So, there you have it. Post your comments, do all that boosting, liking, sharing, thumbs up, and stuff that helps spread the word and poke the algorithms. Follow me on most of the big social media platforms and look for my name, Robin Holstein, or Holstein House. Till next time, bye-bye. Thank you.